Well, good afternoon and welcome to In Focus. My name is Anthony Weber. I am one of the co-hosts of this show and my co-host Kim Binshaddle couldn't be here today. But I have Jack Siegel with me today and he's been on the show before. We're pleased to have him return as we talk about some issues in the Middle East today and how it's affecting the rest of the world. So just briefly, Jack's a retired U.S. diplomat living in Traverse City. He served in the U.S. Embassy in Israel during the first Gulf War. And in Russia, he led the U.S. Embassy's effort to control a Soviet-era chemical weapons stockpile. He also served on the National Security Council at the White House as a director for the Non-Proliferation and in Geneva as State Department representative to the START arms control negotiations. And that's just a short list, I think, of many things. So thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here, Anthony. Thank you very much. So this is a pretty broad topic. Yeah. We're going to basically talk about the Syrian refugee situation, but there's a lot of moving pieces to it, not just mm -hmm. what happened in the Middle East, but the impact it's having around the world right now. So I think we'll start, since, since we have someone knowledgeable of the history and capable of talking about it in ways we don't often get to read in the newspaper. Let's start back with kind of the backdrop. What has brought us to the crisis that we're facing today? Well, the, that particular part of the Middle East uh, is, fits into a large context. The Middle East itself has been troubled by its political history, its religious history, really going back thousands of years. But uh, if we stick with the 20th and 21st centuries, uh, borders were drawn by France and Britain in 1916, a famous Sykes-Picot agreement, a secret agreement, which uh, divided the Middle East, uh, particularly Syria, uh, Israel or Palestine at the time, Iraq, uh, into spheres of influence for Britain and France, and a piece of it actually went to Russia as well. Those lines are still in existence, and today they, they, it's clear that they do not reflect the way the people have settled and the kinds of people who are in the countries that we call Syria and Iraq in particular. Uh, through a lot of actions uh, that uh, piled up over the decades, uh, but particularly in 2003 when the United States invaded Iraq to, with the pr express purpose of overthrowing Saddam Hussein. Mm -hmm. We did so without, uh, it appears, a, an idea of well, what would happen when Saddam was overthrown. And what did happen was we destabilized a kind of shaky structure that had been effective uh, throughout the 1950s on. And that structure was based on dictatorship, a dictatorship in Syria led by the Assad family, Hafez al-Assad and now his son uh, Bashir al-Assad. And in uh, Iraq, it took a little longer to consolidate, but eventually Saddam Hussein took over and ran the country as a dictatorship. So you had stability in Syria and Iraq. And then in 1979, the Islamic Revolution hit Iran and uh, where we had supported the Shah, another dictator, mm -hmm. uh, who was a friend of ours. Uh, he was overthrown and in its place uh, came uh, what it was effectively the world's second is Islamic monarchy in a way. Uh, by that I mean the, the Ayatollah Khomeini and his successor, the Ayatollah Khamenei, uh, created an Islamic Republic. Now, I say it's the second because actually in Saudi Arabia, the Sunni version of this, and I'll come back to that point in a second, the, in Saudi Arabia, the religious leadership were also effectively running the internal politics of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia was reaching out externally and running its oil uh, business, but uh, inside Saudi Arabia, the rules were made by uh, the equivalent of an ayatollah. This, in this in Sunni okay. religion, there is not such a thing. Now, it might be useful at this stage, I think, to look at this map and, and just quickly for, for the non-specialists. Uh, here's a, a map of the Middle East in general, and here we have Iran, and Iran is, is the only, uh, almost completely Shiite, Shiite country. 89% of Iran is the Shiite, uh, 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 adheres to the Shiite version of Islam. In Iraq, the numbers are more like 57% are Shiite. 
and the, the rest are, are either Sunnis or Christians, and I'll come back to the Christians. You see this black area here? This is the area controlled today by the Islamic State. They are Sunnis, okay? Coming back still within Syria, this strip here is controlled by the Assad family, who are Shiites, or a form of Shiite Islam. Now, so we, we've covered this troubled area. The, the area that's uh, most uh, important other player, let's say, in this whole equation is Saudi Arabia itself. It's a huge landmass, but a small population. And Saudi Arabia is the homeland of Sunni Islam. Now, with that kind of uh, very rough background, uh, I'll just say two, a few sentences about what's the difference between Sunnis and Shiites. Can, uh, I, can I clarify yeah. something first? It looks then like you have Shiites kind of on either side and Sunnis in the middle in a very broad geographical sense. Right, then okay. the Islamic State is kind of this island of Sunnis surrounded by Shiites and with a couple other important groups, the Yazidis that people may have heard of, mm -hmm. and the Kurds. Okay. And the Yazidis have been in the news recently because the State Department is considering uh, giving them status of a, as a group that's uh, subjected to genocide, or potentially subjected to genocide. And the Kurds, I believe, were in the news when Saddam was in power because he tended to go after them. Right, he, he tried to, uh, he viciously attacked the Kurds, he gassed them with, mm -hmm. with poison gas. And uh, uh, they've had, they have a lot of enemies. The, the Turks are at, at war with the Kurds in Turkey. Okay. The, there is a group of Kurds called the, uh, uh, the Turkish, the Kurdish Revolutionary Army, the PKK, which uh, the Turks are fighting against. Uh, the Kurds uh, are, are allied with the United States in this effort against ISIS, but what they really are seeking is a Kurdish homeland, which they've never had. Hmm. And they did not get it at the end of the First World War when they, there was a chance to give it to them. I think I interrupted you. You were going to talk a little bit about why there's tension between the Shiites and the Sunnis. Yeah, this uh, unfortunately goes back 1,400 years to the succession to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, the moment Muhammad died, it was not clear how they would decide who would be his successor. Uh, in traditional tribal societies, such as existed at that time in what is now Saudi Arabia, uh, the followers of Muhammad decided to choose someone by voting. Another faction, though, said no, it should be a, a direct descendant of his family. And so uh, there was a, a debate about it, and uh, for the first three successors, they, were, they did not fit that description of a direct descendant. Then, the, then Ali, the fourth successor, was chosen. Uh, but uh, this fracture between Shiites who believe that the succession was wrong from the start, and Sunnis who believe it was right, uh, they, uh, they never really um, uh, worked out their differences, and by the year 1000, uh, these differences had sharpened into a real struggle for control. Now, in, the, in this part of the Middle East, Shiites are very well represented. They are, the, as I said, almost 90% of Iran, 60% of Iraq, and uh, probably a third of Syria. But outside of that particular strip of countries, uh, it's predominantly Sunni, and Sun, uh, Shi, uh, Muslims in Far East, for example, in Asia, are almost all Sunnis. Hmm. So uh, by numbers, the Sunnis are a very dominant number in uh, overall Islam. There's 1.5 billion Muslims in the world, and probably uh, 1.3 of the 1.5 are Sunnis. So does this make a difference too, just based on the background and how this succession, the whole succession debate, does it make a difference with type of government? One strikes me as maybe more amenable to a kind of a grassroots or a people-led, call it democratic form of leadership, and the other, at least in my mind, strikes me as more of a top-down, top down, almost a dictatorial type of leadership. Is that distinction play over into politics, or am I Well, the word close? democracy <laughs> is, uh, is hard to uh, justify in much of the Middle East, or okay. almost all the Middle East. Uh, there are exceptions on the fringes, I would say, uh, where European influence was strongest, like Tunisia, has uh, gone through this process five years ago with the Arab Spring, and now five years later, Tunisia basically has a functioning 
parliamentary democracy. This is what we tried to bring to Iraq, uh, and we tried to create a government that was uh, evenly distributed, Kurds, Sunnis, and Shia. But the Shiites were under Saddam were underrepresented. He was a Sunni, and he suppressed the Shia and the Kurds. Right. So there's kind of a get even attitude in Iraq right now. And uh, the, the current government, which we still support, the United States still supports, is now almost uh, entirely Shia dominated. Shiites are in control. And they have invited in their next door neighbor, the Iranians, also Shiites. So this has increased Iran's influence mm -hmm. in the whole picture. When, uh, Iran shows up on the other side of the map when you, when you see, uh, here's Iran influencing southern Iraq and eastern Iraq, and over here influencing the western part of Syria, which is the Assad family, the, the successor to the father, and also Hezbollah, part of Lebanon. So the, there's a, they've kind of skipped over this area in black, which is where the Sunnis are. Um, so you've got, uh, uh, to, back to this question of democracy though, democracy is not uh, the norm in the Middle East. It's a tribal structure. And uh, as, as I mentioned in, in Iran, that's an Islamic Republic. And so all decisions, all decisions, are, major decisions are made by the Ayatollah mm -hmm. himself. Okay. He is supported by a military wing uh, called the Revolutionary Guards. And uh, he is very much in control. It's very much a, right. a religious dictatorship. In Saudi Arabia, it's, it's, they don't even pretend to be a democracy. It's a monarchy. And uh, the, the one concession they've made to share power is with the religious leadership. So the religious leadership uh, in a group, uh, uh, in a, let's say, a sect called Wahhabi, mm -hmm. uh, Wahhabism, is a very, very strict form of Sunni Islam. And uh, that's why Saudi women can't drive, they can't work, they can't get into a car, they can't go outside without everything but their eyes covered. Uh, they have, this Wahhabism has been, a, a, I think, a very, um, a very dangerous influence because it has been spread. Uh, and it's a very, very conservative influence. Uh, ISIS, the Islamic State, doesn't call themselves Wahhabis, but the, the practice of Islam that they're promoting is very much Wahhabi. It's covering the women up, it's subjugating the women, it's uh, use of the uh, Sharia law to decide all legal cases. So speaking of ISIS, and I, I want to see if we can fast forward a little bit, and maybe we're there already, to what sparked the current crisis with Syrian refugees. Uh, what is it that has brought ISIS front and center, and what is ISIS doing that is causing this mass exodus of refugees from Syria? Well, the United States gets some of the blame here, if not most of the blame. Uh, by destabilizing Iraq, uh, we created a space where the Shiites were becoming more dominant the Sunnis didn't have any place to go because their, their leader, Saddam Hussein, was knocked off. Mm -hmm. And uh, in his place came a Shiite-dominated government. So they began to pull away from the central government structure. At the same time in Syria, uh, there was a, a different kind of a crisis, but Sunnis felt unrepresented by the, the uh, Bashir al-Assad family structure and by their leadership. And so they began to pull away from their central government structure. And they all grouped around this thing called the Islamic State. Uh, and then a leader, uh, al-Baghdadi, named himself the Caliph. Now, of the, the Islamic State? Of, of the world. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and uh, the Caliph is a, is a traditional uh, symbolic uh, status, uh, like the ruler of all Muslims. And so that's a direct challenge to Iran, which says, no, the sure. Ayatollah is the ruler of all Muslims. Uh, and it's a direct challenge to the Wahhabi leadership in Saudi Arabia, uh, because they say, no, we're in charge. So the Islamic State, though, uh, 
took territory very quickly. I was going to say, of those three, they're the one without a country, so right. to speak. But they created a country. They created a, a land area that's uh, bigger than the state of Connecticut. And uh, they now control a uh, million dollars a day in revenue hmm. uh, through oil, through uh, selling, smuggled, smuggling out and selling antiquities, through uh, um, kidnapping, through taxes and tolls and customs duties. All these things are providing a steady flow of income to the Islamic State. The other thing they needed was fighters. And they went on the internet and they developed, uh, with the help of uh, skilled Westerners who joined them, uh, they developed a, a advertising campaign and they developed a following. Now, they also needed military leadership and they found some in Iraqi generals and colonels who found themselves without jobs because they had been pushed out by the Shiite-dominated Iraqi leadership. So again, our action in Iraq had a snowballing effect and, and created this space for the Islamic State. Now, ISIS, the Islamic State, is, they are being pushed back in many directions. Uh, they're under pressure uh, from airstrikes predominantly and from other competing groups, not necessarily good guys. Uh, so instead of ISIS, if you're in Syria, you might find yourself dominated by Al-Qaeda uh, because they are big in Syria right now. And they are competing w with ISIS for control of land. Does of this territory. suggest that even if ISIS were dealt with in some fashion, that uh, there would just give opportunity for Al-Qaeda to become stronger, that someone else would rise in their place? Someone else. It might be Al-Qaeda. The Kurds would push in to try to get more land. Uh, but there may be some natural barriers here into the expansion of ISIS and the expansion of the Kurds and the Shiites. Uh, for instance, the, the Shiite-led army in Iraq right now has pushed towards Ramadi, where some of our brave soldiers fought and died. Uh, over a thousand Americans were killed in Iraq, Ramadi, hmm. um, or in that immediate area. They, they are at the edge of Shiite land. When you go beyond Ramadi, you're in the Sunni Triangle of Iraq. It's, it okay. was called that during our Iraq mm -hmm. War. It's still that. So you're out, you're out off your home base, basically, and, the, and you're in ISIS territory or in some other Sunni group's territory. So there's a limit to how far, I think, Shiite dominance will go. Uh, now, the, the, what's causing people to leave is they don't feel safe. Uh, if you're in ISIS-controlled territory and you're a Sunni, then you basically are safe, but you live under a sort of medieval dictatorship like people felt in Afghanistan when the Taliban were in control. Sure. They didn't like it, but they were safe. They were protected from the outsiders. Uh, the same is true for the Shiites now in eastern and southern Iraq. They are now in a Shiite-dominated area with the support of Iran, a very powerful country, 86 million people in Iran. That's the biggest outside of Egypt. So uh, they, uh, they feel safe there. And the Kurds have their own army, the Peshmerga, so they're protecting themselves. So you have kind of a stable situation right now. Uh, it would be stable, but we, a lot of outside players are destabilizing it. Okay, so <laughs> is it the outside players that are destabilizing ISIS itself? And one of the reasons I ask this is I'm, I'm puzzled by a lot of the news stories I read in which ISIS within Syria is committing pretty atrocious crimes. Mm -hmm. um, if the news stories that I'm seeing, you know, burning people alive and just some fairly horrible things, so obviously people are leaving in droves. That seems counterproductive. You would think ISIS would want the people to stay and thus build their movement, and yet what they're doing seems entirely uh, counter to that. What is happening there that, that this is causing the population to leave, and why isn't ISIS more concerned about that, or maybe they are? I'm sure ISIS is concerned that people are smuggling themselves out of the ISIS areas and becoming refugees. Uh, it, to me, it's um, logical human behavior. If you're a young Syrian and you're 
you know, moderately religious, but you foresee that ISIS and the Shiites and the Western powers and Russia are all going to be in a big struggle for decades. Because mm -hmm. that's what the, the message from Washington has lately become, even from our generals, that this is a decades-long conflict. If you're young and you have a family, you say, I, I don't want to be here for 20 years in the middle of this mess. Right. So I'm going to go to Germany where they say, welcome, come. And a million people have been welcomed into Germany this hmm. year. A million. That's an unbelievably large number. It's not without problems for sure, but uh, it's an open door and people who are ambitious and smart and have some money are saying, I'll take my chances to get across there and get to Germany because I could get a bomb dropped on me tomorrow here and my kids can't go to school and there's no economy and there's, the job situation is terrible, so, et cetera. So, so the situation is ripe to push people out and people have left. Uh, there's um, millions of refugees now and eternally displaced people. Inside Syria, there's 4.7 million IDPs, people who aren't in their homes. They have moved somewhere else within Syria. And then outside Syria, there are an estimated 7 million Syrians who are in refugee status or mm -hmm. on the move. That's very, it's a rough number because there are no refugee camps in Lebanon, but a lot of them went to Lebanon. Uh, they don't know how many people are on the move to Europe. Okay. Uh, so, but it, in a country where 22 million people, you've got about 12 million who are, who are not where they belong. That's a That's huge, huge destruction of a country, basically. So let's talk about how the rest of the world is responding to the refugees. Mm -hmm. Let's start first with, in the Middle East, what has been the response of the surrounding nations there, and then we'll move toward what's been happening in the West. Well, it's been fairly generous in the immediate area. The Turks have accepted 1.8 million Syrians. The Lebanese estimated 1.2 million, but there's no refugee structure in Lebanon. So these are people joining families, extended families of people they know okay. mostly. Jordan, 650,000. Iraq, 250,000. Ironically, people are moving to Iraq from Syria uh, because mm. it's slightly better than where they are. <laughs> And, uh, that says something about the state of things. Yeah. So you, you, you're getting some support in the immediate area. Further afield, the rich uh, Sunni countries are not accepting refugees. And that would be Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait. Uh, Kuwait is uh, almost 50-50 uh, Sunni and Shia. Uh, and these countries have done nothing, basically, to support the refugees except mm -hmm. financial aid. Okay, uh, but they have a they have they have ambivalence here because uh, the countries I just mentioned Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, UAE, and uh, uh, Bahrain they are they are run by Sunnis. They aren't all predominantly Shia. They they aren't all predominantly hmm. Sunni rather, but they are run by Sunnis. Hmm. So uh, they they have sort of mixed feelings because the Islamic State is Sunni. So, uh, for instance, uh, right when the bombing, the U.S. decided to conduct a bombing campaign, we made a big splash about uh, having allies in the Gulf and uh, in the Middle East. And they did. They came in and Jordan, remember the Jordanian fighter who was shot down? The shot down and the pilot was burned alive. You know, horrible event. Yeah. Um, they, Jordan has stopped its airstrikes. Uh, the Saudis were involved for a while, and they have pretty much stopped. Uh, the Kuwaitis were in it for a while, and they have kind of backed off. So pretty much now it's the United States and Russia that are doing the bombing. Hmm. Now, I have to warn people, when, when we have a bombing campaign, I, I, I can relate a story of, uh, we were talking about Afghanistan, but the, 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 the principle is the same. I was, we were in a big table and we were talking about what can we do to win the hearts and minds of the Afghans. And seated next to me was a four-star American Air Force general. And when it got to him, he looked up and he said, I'm a fighter pilot. I drop bombs, kill people, and destroy buildings. And he stopped talking. That's how, he, in his mind, that's what he does. Mm -hmm. 
And so we shouldn't have any misconceptions about precision bombing and, and you know, a campaign, quote unquote. We are destroying buildings and killing people by dropping bombs. We are not seizing territory. So quick side question before I get back to the refugee uh, question. Does a bombing campaign, does it weaken or does it strengthen in the long run? Does it weaken or strengthen the, the causes or the groups that it's attacking, in this case ISIS? It could temporarily uh, weaken, let's say, ISIS uh, by, by uh, reducing their revenue stream. But we could attack the oil infrastructure, and we have been doing that somewhat cautiously because we know from our experience in Kuwait that once you destroy the infrastructure, you got to rebuild it. Right. Somebody's got to rebuild it. Or there's no business, there's no, there's no economic base for the country. So we have mixed feelings about this. Uh, and uh, our bombing has been quite precise. The Russians have taken a different approach. Uh, there was an interview, some of the viewers may have seen 60 Minutes, or they can go online and look it up, because it was just this, uh, in late January, in middle of January this year, 2016. And the Russian general in charge said, what you people are doing is you're kind of spreading your fingers out over the problem, and you're poking here and there and there. He said, to defeat ISIS, you have to make a fist and punch them. Hmm in one concentrated area and then work your way out. And so the Russians are bombing the heck out of specific areas and not too carefully. Uh, not all precision guided weapons, some dumb bombs as they call. <laughs> uh, they're trying to send a message that uh, uh, you guys who are running Syria need to get back to the negotiating table. Hmm. And that's an area that uh, is uh, a weak area in this whole discussion. And it'll be interesting considering how you pointed out, oftentimes the actions, at least, that the U.S. has taken in the Middle East have been counterproductive in the long runs. Uh, I guess we'll see what happens in the future. So let me move this over to what's been happening more in the West as refugees have been coming in. So I'm thinking of the story in the news this week of, I think it was an attack in Cologne. Actually, that was over New Year's. Yeah. I believe, or yeah. a, not really an attack, but a huge mob issue that seemed to be mostly related to the immigrant population. Mm -hmm. There was a shooting at a nightclub in Canada, I think, this week. You had the, the bombings or the attacks in France a month or two ago. So as I listen to the discussion of the impact on the refugees, refugees in the West, there seems to be this tension. On the one hand, just a lot of compassion for what they're going through and going, yeah, if I was there, I'd want to get out too. So it's not like anyone blames them. In fact, I think most of the people that I talk to have a desire to see them find a place of safety. But they're balancing this intention with, it seems like in places, especially in Europe, where the refugee population is rising, there seems to be a connection between a rise of violence also. Now, is, is that an accurate assessment or is this been skewed in how it's been reporting, and it's more of a fear-mongering than it is a reality. Well, I'm not sure it's deliberate the fear-mongering, but it's, it is skewed in that uh, for the tens of thousands of refugees that have come into countries, or in the case of Germany, I mentioned a million in this past year, uh, there have these, been these minor, not minor, I take that word back, forget that, strike <laughs> that. <laughs> there have been these incidents, and because they've been perpetrated by refugees, they, they attach that label to it. So in the case of New Year's Eve in Cologne, uh, there were, uh, that's, a, that's a place right outside the main railway station where people congregate to celebrate the New Year. And there were uh, activities that are not uncommon in Egypt, for example, when large crowds gather men, um, uh, aggressively attack women. Hmm. Uh, they, they fondle women, they uh, try to rape them, uh, on, and that happened in, during the, Islamic, the uh, uh, Arab Spring uh, demonstrations in Egypt hmm. as well. It's not that uncommon, but bringing it to Cologne was unprecedented, sure. and people were shocked. And uh, there were rapes, uh, definitely were rapes, and uh, the uh, Chancellor Merkel got on TV and said, "We're going to we're going to do something. We have to change our policy here uh, because this is not going to be acceptable. It is not acceptable." 
By the way, we're going to have uh, in February the International Affairs Forum. We'll have Dr. Uh, Ingrid Starosta, and she is a German American professor. She's going to be talking about the effect of refugees in Germany, mm. and uh, she's coming uh, to to give a lecture for us. And uh, I think it's February 18th, the third Thursday. Uh, this this impact in Germany uh, has been the biggest because they've accepted the most. In Sweden, they uh, proportionally accepted an equal number of refugees, smaller uh, raw numbers, uh, and they are also having second thoughts. Why are they accepting refugees? Because they have a declining population and they need refugees. Uh, they need to build their population, and the Syrians are the best educated group. They're also getting a lot of Afghans who are leaving Afghanistan for the same reason the Syrians are leaving. There's no future. They can't see a, a safe, secure future where they live. So they're being accepted. Here in the United States, the state of Michigan is uh, second only to California in its acceptance of Syrian refugees this year. Uh, and uh, the, the governor has called a halt to it temporarily. And that's a sad story because most of the refugees coming to Michigan have family members already here. And they were planning to reunite their families. Hmm. And uh, these people are now in limbo again and waiting for a green light from the governor and from the U.S. State Department. Uh, a, a large number of the Syrians coming to Michigan, by the way, are Chaldean Christians. And the Christians are the odd people out in all this. There's been a huge outflow of Christians over the last five years from the Middle East in general. They don't have a home base in any of this. They don't have anyone protecting them. And they don't have an army like the Kurds. Right. So uh, the Christians, uh, it, it's uh, quite ironic that Christianity began in the Middle East, but uh, it could f soon find itself without Christian churches. Hmm. Uh, the, even uh, in our friends, the Egyptians have uh, gone at down, uh, come down very hard on the Coptic Christians in Egypt. Uh, maybe we'll come back to the, the question about how our State Department is responding to that. Are they, are they navigating the, the tensions of, of vetting refugees well and taking those things into consideration or not. I'm going to move something back to the discussion of refugees. As we look in the United States about incorporating refugees into our culture, what can we learn as we observe, especially in Europe probably, because they've had much higher numbers and have been doing it maybe longer? Are there some important things we can learn about how to assimilate refugees well? And then perhaps even from a governmental level, uh, are we vetting well in terms of doing all the things that we can to be careful that we're trying to make sure that ISIS isn't sneaking people in, no system's going to be perfect. So maybe two parts there. Mm -hmm. What can we learn as a culture about how to assimilate well and the importance of it? And how do you feel that our government is doing in terms of trying to keep us safe? Well, if we look at Michigan as an example, uh, the assimilation has been pretty successful. Um, uh, people have to learn English. They can't function in Arabic or some other language here. Uh, and uh, they tend to live in groups of their own culture, but they, they do socialize and they do business inside of a broader culture. In Europe, it, it was not, it was at times it was successful and then it became unsuccessful. And uh, they, uh, particularly, I spent a lot of time in the Netherlands when I was working for NATO. And uh, they, uh, they dropped the idea that people had to assimilate. And they began to let them have uh, uh, use their own language, particularly Arabic. Uh, they even let them run schools in Arabic. And this was a mistake, and they recognize that now. They failed to assimilate that generation mm -hmm. into the culture. But the, the biggest uh, source of radicalism in Europe is from Belgium, which had also uh, fail, this failure to assimilate, and in France. France, uh, poor people live in the suburbs, in big apartment blocks. And uh, the wealthy people live in the center of the city. So hmm. uh, in the suburbs, you had mosques developed that were radical mosques. And the government didn't want to step in because they didn't really have a solution. And so they let it go. And so radicalism developed in the suburbs of Paris. Uh, Paris is probably 15% Muslim. Uh, the country itself is about 9% Muslim. Uh, same thing in Belgium, similar numbers. And there in Belgium, you have this one uh, 
uh, neighborhood, Molenbeek, which is uh, almost entirely uh, Muslim and which uh, has become a hotbed of radicalism. It sounds like you're saying that if someone takes the approach that they feel like it's an us versus them mentality and they want to create distance, it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that the way you get by that is for everyone to ins insist, no, we'll figure out how to do life together. And that means learning to, I'll say assimilate, I feel like I've used it too many times, mm -hmm. but I don't have a better word for it. I think it's, it's fair to say it that way, that if you think of it, as, uh, how did these things play out? The people came from conflict zones, uh, and the first generation who arrived were just grateful for what help they got, and they were appreciative of the, the country that took them in. The second generation, these kids grow up, and they find that they're outsiders. They don't really speak the language that well. Uh, they, they aren't part of the cultural environment that they have been plunked into. And uh, if they have kind of dead-end jobs or no jobs, uh, which is often the case, then they're, they're prime for being radicalized. And what was going on, uh, for instance, in France, they discovered, was uh, there were imams selected by the country, the government, to run the mosques. And they were relatively old-fashioned, early generation arrivals in France very cooperative with the government. So outside the mosques would be these young imams, and they would spot young people coming in, and they would say, hey, come over here, and we'll do a service hmm. over here. And they would be in the park next to the mosque, and they would give them a radical version. Hmm. And this radicalization was not put, they didn't put a stop to it. Uh, because as I said, they didn't really have a plan for how to put a stop to it. And that's a big, big question. You can say, well, we got to stop this radicalization of Muslims, young Muslims. And you then better ask yourself, how? What exactly can we do? You know, because there's these young imams, these radical imams are selling the idea that the United States and now Russia and uh, these conservative regimes have created this problem and that the only solution is to pursue a radical form of Islam and to get rid of these outsiders. Hmm. So uh, this, now, what, why are these young people attracted? I mean, because you, you're, you're, uh, a lot of them are going to get killed on the battlefield. It sounds like you're, they're offering them a place, like a place. do something meaningful, Precisely. will be your home. Yeah, you can come out of that dead-end job flipping hamburgers and you can, you can go fight for your religion. Hmm. And if you die, you go to heaven. So what's the problem? So come join us. Uh, we will train you. We will give you pride. And, hmm. uh, you know, we will, we will give you a hopeful future. And hope is a, is a powerful uh, motivator. I once uh, was in a conversation with Yitzhak Rabin in Israel. And uh, he, he leaned back and he said, we, meaning the Israelis and the Palestinians, will have peace when the Palestinians have hope. Hmm. And uh, these kids today in Paris and in Brussels and all these places, they don't have hope. And so they get hope by going online and, and listening to this propaganda. And uh, it says, here's how you come to Turkey and from Turkey we'll get you into Syria and you'll be fighting. It's the strong voice that comes to them and says, you matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's a, you know, a huge uh, challenge for the Western countries. Sure. What, what do you think the answer is in the United States, Jack? How do we go about creating an environment that does offer that hope and that assimilation? Uh, is there a simple solution for that? No, there's no simple solution, but uh, it, the solution may be just down the street from you and you may not know it. I'll put it that way. Uh, I put on my Facebook page something somebody sent to me. A little girl, you know, you see kids in the spring and they put up a stand and it says lemonade, five cents. And this little girl puts up a stand and it says above it, come talk to a Muslim. Hmm. And her father was there with her. And she set up this little stand in, in an area where people could walk up and, and, and for some it would be the first time they had ever knowingly met or spoken to a Muslim. And uh, it's, 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 this, it's going to be community-based that we're going to solve this problem for 
our Muslims, not for the ones in Paris. We can't right. solve that for them. But we have Muslims in, in our immediate area. We have over 300 Chaldean Christians in Leelanau County. Really? Yes. Now, you don't know who they are. Right. And they don't advertise. But, you know, you know people who are Muslims in this case, but are from the Middle East. Okay, that's fascinating <laughs> to me because I was just going to say, well, up here in northern Michigan, we don't really have that many opportunities, You've but got we do. They're here. Uh, and, it, you know, if your church or your synagogue or your mosque reaches out and says, okay, let's make contact with the others around us and let's have a discussion group. Let's, let's meet on a, 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 an evening and talk about this exact problem we've been discussing in this show and say, what can we do here? There is something we can do here. The, the, the refugees are in desperate need of help, of all sorts of help. Right. And uh, they, you know, that's something you can do as a community. But it's also that, you know, find out who lives in your own neighborhood who might be either from the Middle East a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew, and then if whatever they are, learn about what is really going on because they probably know more than the average person because they have relatives there, and they and they can and they're getting feedback, they're getting information, and it's 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 kind of on the ground, real real facts rather I, than hype. I think that's a great point. I tend to think of this in terms of. What will the State Department do? Mm. I, I think of it in global or national dynamics, which, if I'm hearing you correctly, might be the precise opposite way I ought to be thinking of it just as a citizen, uh, and that is, who's my neighbor, and how can I show them compassion? And You know, you know. even, you know, we have millions of, uh, of public interest, public service groups in this area, and uh, any of these groups can, can discuss this. What could we do to help the, the refugee situation? And, uh, you know, we, can we invite a refugee family to our area, to our town, to our, our little village? Uh, these things could be done, and there are organizations, you know, dying to find sponsors. Hmm. And, uh, you know, we, we tend to look at these as global problems that somebody in Washington is going to solve, but all of our politicians are saying the same thing. Washington can't solve anything. Don't we get it yet? You know? <laughs> uh, I mean, I worked, I love the State Department. I worked for the right. State Department. Uh, but, you know, th these problems are human problems at people to people level, and that's where they will really be solved. Uh, you know, I, I, I have a dear uh, cousin of mine who, uh, she worried about um, homeless people. And she didn't just worry about it. She took one into her home and raised him hmm. from the age of 20. And uh, she's written a little book about it because I met this kid five years later and he's, he, she, it took her five years to socialize him back into society because he was homeless. He had been for years and he had become sort of semi-wild uh, and uh, he had to be reprogrammed in a way to join society, get a job, you know, do all those things that we take for granted. The solution is not to push away, the solution is to walk close. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. We've got just a couple minutes left yet, Jack, and I'm just, I'm curious, uh, now that we've talked about the local aspect of it, do you feel like at a national level, America in general, the United States in general, is doing a good job of, of trying to balance that tension of bringing in refugees and yet making sure that the proper processes are gone through to do the best we can to, to, to see if there's people there who we ought not to be letting in. Do you feel like we're, we're doing a commendable job on that or that our government is? Well, vetting potential arrivals for the United States, people coming to the United States is very, very hard. Uh, the paperwork is often not there. Uh, you are doing interviews in a foreign language often. Uh, and particularly since 9-11, you know, some visa officer somewhere in the Middle East stamped a visa approved for the 11 hijackers. Each one of them had a right. visa. And that's a lesson that every diplomat learns that, well, it's easier to say no. It's safer. I won't go, I won't, nobody will criticize me if I reject them all. But then we aren't having to solve the problem. Right. And so uh, we're not going to have 100% vetting. I mean, look who perpetrated the crimes. 
the ones in Paris, the attacks in Paris, were perpetrated by Parisians and by Belgians, not by refugees. Uh, there may have been one refugee involved in that whole series mm -hmm. of attacks. Uh, the same thing in the earlier Charlie Hebdo uh, attacks. Our own domestic terrorism, uh, the attempt in Times Square, the attempt uh, on, the, uh, on the bomber, uh, the guy who was on uh, the plane headed for Detroit with the underwear bomber, mm -hmm. these were Americans. So uh, we don't need to look way out there and say, well, how are we going to keep those bad people out? You're never going to have 100%. If you take in 1,000 Syrian refugees, I, it's almost a certainty that one of them might be a radical Islamist. Uh, and there's no way to detect that. You know, the, the uh, attack in San Bernardino, we have these two people, one an American and one this woman from Saudi Arabia. And the, there was a criticism, well, they never asked her if she was a radical. And I said, <laughs> What's she gonna say? Yeah, oh, I said, what a ridiculous <laughs> right. statement. Of course she would say, no, no, I don't hate these radicals. <laughs> right. You know, you, you, gotta, you gotta be a little smarter than that. But we're, we're never gonna have 100% security, and we have to accept that. Uh, we have to, we, I think this, that 100% security comes from making these people feel like they are part of our society. And they have a vested interest in staying in our society. Yeah. not attacking it. And uh, that's not always going to be predictable. The, the guy, the, the male and the couple that conducted the San Bernardino attack, he sure looked assimilated. Mm -hmm. He had a job with a government agency. Uh, he was doing good work. Uh, he was friendly with his co-workers. And then, soon. Yeah. So that's, that's quite unpredictable. On that sort of, the, if we have a minute, just on the national level, there are peace talks underway involving Syria hopefully. Uh, in, in Yemen, there's a shaky ceasefire. In Iran, we're in the process of implementing the nuclear deal. And even in Iraq, there is an effort to strengthen the coalition aspect of having this, the Kurds and the Sunnis involved. So there, there is a diplomatic track that uh, is not getting much attention. Uh, it, is, uh, there, it is a source of mild scant little sliver of hope because ultimately people have to stop this fighting it's, it's just getting worse and it'll take decades to, to repair it does russia kind of remain the wild card there or are they coming to the table the diplomatic table also well the russia is happy to be at the table as long as they have a, a seat at the head of the table next to the united states mm. and they've pretty much managed that now uh, they they have taken over a big part of the bombing uh, we have uh, sort of tacitly accepted that um, uh, Assad has to go, but not right away, where we used to say he has to go before we even talk. Mm -hmm. Now we don't say that anymore. So we've shifted our position. Uh, the Russians, they have an interest here. Syria has been an ally of Russia for 50 years. Syria has allowed Russia to have an air base and a sea base, a naval base in Syria hmm. uh, for Russia. They don't, they don't want, they want to support their ally and they want to keep those bases, but most importantly, they want to have the prestige of finding a solution. Now that's an opening for a diplomat. If they want the prestige, they want to share the prestige, then let's get at it. Yeah. You know, let's stop the fighting. And uh, maybe with their influence over Assad, uh, they might be able to do that, or that we might be able to sort of put a ring around ISIS and just sort of contain it for a while and maybe starve it economically. Yeah. Well, Jack, thanks for joining us today, and thanks I appreciate the insight. I always enjoy talking to you. I learn far more than I do uh, perusing the internet and trying to find stories. <laughs> and you have a lot of life experience that uh, gives you a wealth of wisdom on this. So thanks I for joining us. I appreciate it, Anthony. Thank you for having me on, and I hope this has been helpful and enjoyable for the audience. Today. Very much so. Good. And thank you for joining us in In Focus.